later on for sharing some of the things that God has done in my heart through this book, but I do hope you are blessed and helped and encouraged as I share one thought, if you like, from Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4 in your Bibles. We all love to hear John 3, 16, let's say it together, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son 
that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God only had one son and he offered that son for us to die so that we could live and be set free from our sin. And that's our gospel message really, isn't it? The gospel is foreshadowed throughout the Old Testament. It's pictured throughout the Old Testament. And one of the greatest and clearest pictures in the Old Testament of the gospel is found in Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham was asked by God to offer up his son Isaac. It's a tremendously powerful picture, but there's only one problem with that picture. And the problem is this, Abraham had more than one son. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The title of this morning's message is, There's Only Room for One Son. There's Only Room for One Son. Genesis, or Galatians chapter 4, we're going to go back to Genesis, but Galatians chapter 4 for the moment, we're going to read verse 22 down to verse 31. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was of promise, or by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, or Hagar, as it's in the Old Testament. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou, barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children promised. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. This morning, we're going to really delve into that, what that means. Let's go to the Lord of prayer. Father in heaven, I do pray you bless your word this morning. Thank you for blessing the Sunday school class, Lord. I do pray for those who weren't able to make the Sunday school class as Josiah's going through um, Ecclesiastes. I pray that you enable them to be there for next Sunday school and, and, and not miss the blessing. You have a blessing for your people. Let them not miss anything of the blessing you have for them. So I pray now, Lord, as we gather together in your name, I pray, I, I praise you for everyone that's here. And I pray, God, you'd meet with us in a very special way. And we will hear from God. This is your hour, our Lord, now. Let us hear from you, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, first thing I want to share is number one. Abraham had two sons. Now, well, you know, that's what we're going to talk about. He had many sons after with Keturah, but we're not going to talk about that today. That's sort of totally irrelevant to our text this morning. But he basically had two sons. And the reason why is, number one, he, for, he, he, he struggled to wait on God. He struggled to wait on God. Look at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. You know, Abraham and Sarah had a good marriage. They had a good marriage. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 in your Bibles. We're going to survey the life of Abraham quickly so we can put all the pieces together. But Abraham had a good marriage. Abraham and Sarah. We're looking at verse um, 10. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abraham, who is, we know as Abraham, went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. He liked to look upon his wife. That's a good thing, isn't it? He was attracted to her. You know, and she was one of those wives that was very supportive of Abraham. Did whatever he asked her to do. Look at verse 13. Of course, well, this was unreasonable, and perhaps this was unreasonable. We won't go there into the ethics of what she did. But, but she was definitely very supportive of him. Look at verse 13. Say, I, I pray thee that thou art my sister, that it may be well with, my, with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. 
And it came to pass that when Abraham was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman. She was very fair. The princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And so she was taken into Pharaoh's house because she said she was Abraham's sister, and by saying so, um, he was, she was actually doing what he asked of her. They had a good marriage. But there was a problem. Sarah was childless. Go to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. Sarai, which is later, she's later called Sarah, which means princess. But Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. She was childless. She blamed herself for being barren, barren, and Abraham didn't argue. Look at verse 1 again. Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me. It's my fault, Abraham. God has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee go in unto my maid. It, it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. She blamed herself for being barren, but Abraham did not argue with her. He loved his wife, but unfortunately he didn't comfort her regarding her barrenness. They had a good marriage. But it was about to be severely tested. Do you ever notice in life that things go really well for a while and then the testing comes? The testing comes. It's not a bad thing, it's just reality, right? Abraham and Sarah had a good marriage, but their marriage union had been promised blessing. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12 here. We're going to go back a little bit here. Genesis 12. They've been promised blessing. God promised him, Abraham, a nation of children. Look at verse 1. And now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great. God promised him a nation of children. If you're going to have a nation of children, it begins with one son, right? At least one, maybe many. God promised him a large land for that nation, that great nation. Genesis 13. We're following this through in the scriptures. Genesis 13, look at verse 14. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up thou thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which thou seest, to, the, to thee will I give it to, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And you know what? God's not going to promise you all this land unless he expects to fill it with people, right? I'm encouraged this morning. We're hopefully a month away from closing on this building. God doesn't give a church a building unless he expects to fill it with people. And we need more young children in this church. And God is well able to bring in families with young children, isn't he? Because that church can't continue without young people, right? God is able, brethren. God is able. And God promised Abraham this land. And, and if God promised the land, he's going to have children to fill the land. God reconfirmed that promise after several years. Look at chapter 15. We're looking at this picture all the way through. Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given me no seed. Lord, one born of my house is mine heir. Lord, what am I going to do here? Is my servant going to be the one? And lo, the word, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth at thine own bowels, that shall be thine heir. It's going to be your son, your seed, Abraham. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars that to be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. 
Now think with me. There's no reason in the world for Abraham to believe that God's promise would not come through Sarah, his wife. Okay? There's no reason in the world. If he had questions, go to the Lord about it. He was the one that made the promise. Are you with me here? Surely, Abraham could have brought this matter before the Lord. But Abraham struggled like we do. He struggled to wait on God. Brethren, they had been waiting all their married life to have children. Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 30. We're going to go backwards here. Genesis 11, 30, maybe you haven't seen this before. This is before God even called Abraham to go to, uh, uh, come out of her, or, uh, or out of Haran, should I say, in, the, in Iraq, in Mesopotamia back then, and, and come down to the promised land. Before God even called Abraham, verse 30, but Sarai was barren and she had no child. All their married life, they wanted to have children, and, 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 and God had not given them children yet. And now at this stage in Abraham's life, at this stage in his life, the Bible tells us, the Bible lets us, lets us to know that um, Abraham was getting older and older and older. God called him at the age of 75. Those promises were still unfulfilled 10 years later. We know that from, from Genesis 16. We won't read that yet. But brethren, Abraham had waited a very, 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 very long time for God to answer his prayers. And there's nothing like waiting to test your faith to the nth degree. God makes a promise to us, and we get a promise in our Bibles and stuff like that. We can wait a week, we can wait a, wait a month, but when you're waiting a year, two years, five years, ten years, you start to really get antsy, don't you? It starts to get hard. Some have waited years for their beloved spouses to come to the Lord. Some have waited years for their children to return to the fold. Some have waited years for a better standard of living or better prospects in their job or to get out of debt. Some have waited years to be finally treated the way they feel they should be, the way they should feel they should be treated. Brethren, I'm here to tell you this morning, it's hard to wait on the Lord. It's hard, isn't it? Some have waited for years for changes that they desperately need to see in their lives. And brethren, those changes are very, very real. What they're experiencing in their lives is very, very real. And some are thinking, you know what? I keep going to be before, before the Lord. I don't want to keep bothering the Lord with these small things when God has bigger things to be concerned with. Some people think that. But I'm here to, 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 to tell you this morning, if it's big to you, it's big to God. Because I know from my Bible that God cares for every area of our lives. Our God cares. And we may be carrying heavy burdens. We may come into church with a smile on our face. We may go home and look at the children with a smile on our face. We may talk to the neighbors with a smile on our face. But inside we're dying. Because there are things we're praying about and, and asking God for for years. And it's like, when is God ever going to do these things that I ask of him? It's hard to wait on God. It just is. It's difficult. That's where Abraham and Sarah were at. Both of them struggled to wait on God. And I think we can all relate to that, can't we? Abraham had two sons because he struggled to wait on God. But secondly, we're going back to Galatians in our Bibles. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Abraham had two sons because he struggled to wait on God. Abraham had two sons because he sought a solution himself. Look at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond maid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh. After the flesh. In our own human strength. And you know, isn't that what we do? If God doesn't figure it out, we'll help him out. Isn't that human nature? I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. You know, maybe God just wants us to help him out here. 
You know, it made sense for Abraham to find a solution in Hagar. After all, God had brought Hagar into their lives. She was a blessing from the Lord. She was a trustworthy, bond woman. She loved their family. This was a blessing from God. This just had to be God's will. So when Sarah said, you know what? Why don't you just take Hagar, my bond servant, to be your wife? Now, she'll still be a concubine. She'll be a concubine. She won't be a living wife. She'll be sort of like a wife. And I'm like, well, yeah, why did I think about this? This has got to be God's will. Of course, the Lord brought her out of Egypt. Do you remember when we were down in Egypt? And do you remember, you know, we got all these blessings from the king of Abimelech after I pretended you were my sister? Do you remember all that? You know, and, and God has blessed us. This is a blessing from the Lord. It only made sense to a couple who were running out of time. She would understand her role was to meet this big family need. And to keep the family alive, uh, the family name, should I say, alive. Hagar would understand, wouldn't you? You know, brethren, we as believers are so good at looking at solutions and looking for solutions without God, aren't we? Let's face it. We are looking. What we're looking for is really big to us. And every single one of you in this room has something really big you'd love God to do right now. Every one of you. Every one of us do. Perhaps we do not have a Christ, the Christian family we've always dreamed of. And you, you dream for years. That you're, it would take, and it's like, this is not panning out the way I wish it was. Perhaps you're just scraping by, always struggling to pay your bills. Perhaps you have these goals and dreams and ambitions that are far out of sight and, and, and uh, your expectations have been crushed and you're like, this is not what I signed up for. This is not the way I thought it would be. I thought if I went to church, if I read my Bible, if I prayed, I gave my life to Christ, things would be different. They're just not. These are the times, brethren, when we tend to take matters into our own hands. God helps those who help themselves. Isn't that right? That's what we say. He will understand the changes we make when we're not happy with our circumstances, won't he? And that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah thought, and that's how they ended up with two sons when God always intended them to just have one. Abraham just couldn't wait and he sought a solution in himself, and I think we all get this. I remember praying about a change in my circumstances, and again, it's very personal, I can't share it publicly. But I was desperately needing change in my life. And I specifically asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if such and such approaches me and talks to me, I'll know you're in this. And all the pieces started to come together really nicely, except for one piece. It was a pretty big piece, but just one piece. But everything else, everything else was falling into place. I even had a pastor say, you know, this is right, this is right, you've got to do this. But it was that one piece that was always bothering me. And then I found out later it wasn't God's will, and I really, really, really thought it was. I'm sure I'm not the only one that this, this has happened to. I can't share the details. But I think you can put, put in the pieces in your own life because maybe this has happened to you as well. We're really good at making things look like they're God's will when they're really not. And I, I honestly believe that's what Abraham and Sarah did. You know, when Abraham took Hagar to be his wife, he's like, praise the Lord, let's pray. Let's have a family altar. Let's have a worship time. Let's just thank the Lord for his blessings. Thank God from whom all blessings flow. God, thank you for answering my prayer. This is obviously what you meant. And the Lord's looking and saying, no, this is not what I wanted at all. You jumped the gun, Abraham. Abraham's solution, brethren, was after the flesh. Look at verse 23 again. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. It was a carnal solution. It was a worldly solution. It was a solution born out of self-willed, sinful heart that operated contrary to God's will and contrary to God's word. But this, what happened, brethren, God allowed this to be written down in Abraham's life. And if you know anything about Abraham, he was a man of God. He was a great man. He was a faithful 
sinful man. He was, he was a, a man after God's own heart. He was, a friend, he was a friend of God. But yet God recorded his failures because we need this. We need to see how even good godly men fail and how we can avoid those pitfalls. Abraham's solution now serves as an object lesson, posing the question to us as to whether we will live after the flesh or will we live after the spirit. And every one of us can convince ourselves we're living after the spirit or we're not, in the same way that Abraham could convince himself he was doing God's will when he wasn't. But we've got to take an honest look. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to quickly look through, because this is actually the theme of the book of Galatians. Galatians is all about you're going to live after the works of the flesh, you're going to live after, uh, you're going to live after the spirit. And brethren, the works of the flesh aren't always wrong, in humanly speaking. They can be good things, humanly speaking, but they're still the works of the flesh. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Pa Paul says to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him, that's Christ, that called you into the grace of Christ, onto another gospel. Galatians, what happened to you? You started off with grace, depending on the Lord for everything, rejoicing in the goodness of God, and, and now you're gone to another gospel. You've changed direction. You've changed tracks. You've changed channels. What's happened to you? And so we have to ask ourselves a question. Will we live after the gospel of grace? Or are we going to live after another gospel? Look at chapter 2 verse 4. Paul goes on and he's explaining what they were going through. And he said, And that because of false brethren unaware is brought in, who came in privately or privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that, we might, that they might bring us into bondage. And really, that's the whole theme of the book. Being taken out of the freedom Christ has given you and been brought into this bondage. And that was happening with the Galatians. And so we asked the question, will we live in Christian liberty or will we be entangled in bondage? And we talked about that last Wednesday. And I, I, it's, it happens. Brethren, Christ saved us and set us free not to live in bondage. And if we're going around with a heaviness, with a ache in our hearts, as if the, the word is going to, to crave in around us, how can we say we're free? That's not being free. If we're looking to some other method other than Christ, or some other something other than Christ to find some satisfaction and find fulfillment, how can we say we're free? That's what the Galatians were doing. And we have to ask ourselves a question, are we going to lose that liberty to go back into bondage? And for them, the bondage was actually going through the, the laws. I mean, trying to get everything right in the Bible. I mean, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Okay, what do I do even now? Okay, give me a list. Okay, here's the list. Okay, I'll go by the list. That's bondage. Christ didn't save you to live by a list. He saved you to live by his grace. Brethren, will we be justified by our works or by our faith in the Lord? Look at chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Again, Paul is just bringing this out in the book of Galatians as he uses the allegory of Hagar. We're going to build to this. Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Brethren, you're never going to please God by what you do. He's not interested in your performance. He doesn't want it. He wants you. There are some people who think, you know, I'm not an A student, I'm no good, I'll never be as good as that person over there, I'm not an A student. God is not interested in A students. He is interested in the student himself. No matter what grade you get, would you honor him? A man is not justified by the works of the law. You're not a better Christian because you come to church for every service. I wish everybody would come to every service. I'm the pastor, of course I'm going to say that. But it doesn't make you a better Christian. Reading the Bible every day doesn't make you a better Christian. I think reading, not reading the Bible every day doesn't help you. But praying every day doesn't make you a better Christian. You're not justified by your works. You're justified by faith. Isn't that how we got saved? Amen? 
Okay, how do you get saved? How do you become a Christian? Okay, what you need to do is this, this, and this. You need to read your Bible every day. You need to be in this. You need to do this, and then you have to live a really good. Is that how you get saved, or was it by faith in Christ? Yeah. It's faith in Christ, and that's how we live. Faith in Christ. God, I need you because if you don't intervene in my life, I'm going to be an absolute failure. That's a great place to be at. That's called faith. A man is not justified by the works of the law. So many of God's people are in bondage. I think so many of God's people just said, what's the point? I can't do it. It doesn't work for me. I'm just going to, I'll just do my best. That's called defeatism. God didn't call us to do our best. God calls us to trust him. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves doing stuff we didn't think we ever could do. Because we're trusting him, right? It's all Christ. And that is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. God is not going to say, oh, well done, thou good and productive servant. He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful. Faithful Christians trust in a faithful God. Aren't you glad about that? But if whilst we seek to be justified by Christ, brethren, Paul is not writing to unbelievers, he's writing to Christians. And if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. These are people trying to justify themselves by the works of the law. Paul was dealing with that. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what makes me a good Christian? By what I do? or by who Christ is. Brethren, it's possible to start well but finish poorly. I think we've all seen people who started well but didn't finish the course. Verse three, chapter three, verse one. O oh, foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only what I learned of you, received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are ye, verse three, so foolish, have be good in the spirit, are you not made perfect by the flesh? What a great verse. How did you get saved? You began in the Spirit. How are you perfected by the work of the Spirit in your life? Do you know what's so freeing about that? It's not you. Never was, never will be. It's always Christ. Christ, only Christ. That's a wonderful thing. It's possible for us to start well but finish poorly if we get off track. It's possible for us to live by sight and not by faith, verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in, in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. We live our whole lives and completely depends on the Lord saying, God, you need to help me. That's how you wake up in the morning. That's how you continue on with your day. That's how you finish at night. God, I will not be a good husband unless you help me. I'm going to fail my wife. I'm going to fail my children. Lord, I'm not going to be a good Christian. I'm not going to be a good neighbor. I'm not going to be good at my job. I'm not going to be good at my studies. I'm not going to be good at anything unless I need your help. Please, God, help me. I'll do what you ask of me. But Lord, you've got to make up the shortfall. That's a lot of shortfall there, isn't there? That's living by faith. But that's freeing. It doesn't put you in bondage at all, it sets you free. Some turn to worldly means and worldly methods to advance their own cause. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where to ye desire again to be in bondage? And some people live under the weak and bend, but, uh, beggarly elements, and if all it does is bring us back into bondage. And brethren, I know one thing. If I'm in bondage, I'm not free. We can say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. Probably just sing on key. But we can sing those songs. I'm miserable all the day. You know? Because you're in bondage. You're not free. And freedom does not come from outside. It comes from the inside. You could be in a battlefield. You could be in horrendous circumstances having going around in your life. You could have all just absolutely detrimental stuff going on in your life that would send people mental or send people into all sorts of addiction and have joy and peace and be free because Christ gives you freedom about your circumstances. 
That's what God wants for us. He wants us to be free. He wants us to be free. But brethren, we're not free when we seek a solution ourselves instead of waiting upon God. And that's what Abraham did. God wants us to learn from this faithful servant who saw his error and he turned back to Christ. Brethren, I want you to, I want you to listen very carefully to this. God is much more interested in the work that he's doing in your heart than the stuff that everybody else sees on the outside. Because everybody sees stuff about you, and that you have a reputation, and they know stuff about you, and they think stuff about you. Some of it may be true, some of it may not be true. But the real thing that is really true is who you really are inside that body, behind those eyes. That's the real you. That's the person God's really interested in. That's the person he cares for. Not what everybody else sees. There are some people who live their life trying to be something they're not. God wants to know who you are. And he loves you, who you are, where you're at. And he knows full well how to take you from where you're at to where you need to be. Which is, can you say amen for that? Mm -hmm. Brethren, we need to stop looking for solutions to our problems. That almost sounds heretical, doesn't it? We need to stop looking for solutions to our problems and learn to start waiting on God. But we, I'm solution oriented, so if people start looking for solutions, I'm with you. But one of the big problems with that is impatience. And you don't wait on God to do what he wants to do. Does that make sense? Abraham had two sons because he struggled to wait on God. Number two, he had, he had two sons because he sought a solution himself. But thirdly, Abraham had two sons because he didn't look upward. Look at Galatians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 26. Galatians 4, 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. So let's talk about this Jerusalem for a second. God just wanted... Abraham to wait. We'll talk about Jerusalem in a minute. God just wanted Abraham to wait. If Abraham was anything like us, he regularly brought his needs before the Lord. He had his prayer time. He had his Bible time. He fellowshiped with God. And he always ended his prayer with his biggest request. And what was his biggest request? You can speak. I know it's pre I'm preaching, but you can say what it is. A son. He wanted a son. He always ended his prayer, Lord, don't forget the son that I'm looking for. It's like you, you're, you're praying, you're praying in the car, you're praying on your bike, you're praying in your, on the bus, you're praying as you walk, and you say, Lord, I don't forget this. And you, 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 bring it, you, you end your prayer request with that thing that's really on your heart, that's needling away at you all the time, right? He and Sarah, that now though, were uh, very aged. Hebrews says, and him as good as dead. I always thought that was funny. How would God keep his promise? How would the word of the Lord be fulfilled? Brethren, that's not Abraham's job to figure it out. That's actually freeing. Sometimes we spend so much time trying to give God advice in our prayer times. Do you know what I'm saying? Guilty, 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 guilty. Let's have a conversation right now. I'm going to come forward, right? God doesn't need our advice. He has to figure it out. We worry about so many things that we can't fix. Matthew 6, 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Roughly translated, Don't worry about the leaving, sir. Don't worry about your college place. Don't worry about your job prospects. Don't worry about your standard of living. Don't worry about what you're getting out of life. Don't worry about your future. Just wait on God. So many Christians like Abraham take matters into their own hands and they make decisions that they live to regret. To the world, they are smart, they're creative, they're solution-oriented. To God, they're faithless because they wouldn't make the hard decision, which is to wait on God. Brethren, we have to remember that God cares about every area of our lives. Matthew 6, 32. Your heavenly Father knoweth what ye have need of, that ye have need of all these things. 
Nothing that's going on in your life right now catches God by surprise. And that burden that you're carrying in your heart right now, the Lord sees right, he's looking at it right now, and he cares about it right now. We just need to learn to look to the Lord. Matthew 6, 33. But see, help me seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's all the things we're burdened about, right? We just need to bring before the Lord, look up, and then wait. I hate that we wait, don't you? Can we move on? <laughs> Brethren, God just wanted Abraham to wait. God wants us to look beyond Sinai to the new Jerusalem. Look at verse 24 again. I said I'd talk about this now. Which things are an allegory, verse 24? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, right? Which generates the bondage. The law of God, two commandments, you have to do this, you have to do this, and all these rules ugh, weighs you down, which is Hagar. For this Hagar, or Hagar, or Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and as for to Jerusalem, and, and his counterpart is Jerusalem, which now it is, and, is, and Jerusalem now is in bondage to, 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 to her, uh, with, with her children, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Brethren, there is a Jerusalem which is above. Sinai is where Moses received the Ten Commandments. It's high up. And you know what? It's a mountain. You have some, Moses had to climb up that mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And, and God's standards are high to live by. Thou shalt not kill. Okay, I can do that one. But thou shalt not steal. It's a bit harder, isn't it? Because there's all sorts of aspects regarding stealing. We can steal people's time. We can take things that aren't ours and justify it because we didn't get the purpose in the job or whatever. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, okay, that's easier to keep, but thou shalt not look upon a woman to lust after her. Oh, that's a bit harder, isn't it? Thou shalt not covet. That's a real tough one. But you look at what people have. You were really happy until somebody told you what you didn't have. I'm a salesman that comes to sell you a new car. It made you miserable, didn't they? <laughs> that should not bear false witness. Unless it's a white lie, then it's okay. No, that's not what it says. Or blaspheme, even when you're angry. Brethren, the law, God's standards are high. And some believers have this way that they keep, they're going to keep God's standards. And they have their own methodology of this, and they have their own personal standards, and they look down their noses at people who don't keep their standards. Galatians deals with that. The brethren, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone has failed keeping God's standards. Every one of us has sinned and fallen into crushing defeat. And that's why we have to get our eyes off Sinai and above us but there's an even higher mountain. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free. God wants us to look to Jerusalem. This new Jerusalem is described in Revelation chapter 21, and we say, what's heaven like? And we read Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 is really the new Jerusalem. Verse two tells us it's suspended between the heaven and the earth. It's higher than any mountain on earth, greater than any law. It's not marked by man's failures. It's marked by Christ's presence. It's where God is on his throne, high and exalted above all. It's up. And brethren, the lesson is God wants us to look up. He wants us to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. He wants us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If Abraham had kept his eyes upward, he only would have had one son. If we keep our eyes upward, we will... Keep looking to the Lord instead of looking for our own solutions to our problems. Abraham had two sons because he struggled to wait. He had two sons because he sought a solution in himself. And uh, he had two sons because he didn't look upward. But finally, Abraham had two sons. But brethren, one had to go. One had to go. Look at verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now, because Ishmael persecuted Isaac, Hagar persecuted Sarah. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
So then, brethren, we are not the children bondage of the bondwoman, but of the free. Brethren, Abraham's sons were not equal. They were, from two, they were two different sons from two different mothers. One mother was a wife, the other was a maid. One child was the legitimate heir, the other was not. One son was not legitimate, and he was a thorn in the flesh to the son who was legitimate. Brethren, there was not room enough in Abraham's house for two of those sons. One of them had to go, and it wasn't going to be the son of promise. Abraham had to cast out the bondwoman of her son. Look at verse 30. Nevertheless, what's the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. What does that mean for us? Well, Abraham had to cast out the consequences of decisions when he would not wait upon God. Brethren, we've got to do the same. Whatever you have done because you wouldn't wait upon God, backtrack. He had to cast out his solutions to his problems and go back to waiting on God for the perfect solution and for God's perfect timing. God has perfect timing. And if you are able to backtrack and go back to where you should have been before you moved off, before you wouldn't wait upon God, get back to, you, to that place there and wait on God's solution. Brethren, it was difficult. It was difficult for Abraham to have a sit-down conversation with Hagar and Ishmael and say, listen, Ishmael, you've got to go. You're mocking my son. There's tension in the house. There's nothing but problems. And, and I can't fix it. And the tears will probably flow down his cheeks. You're my son, but you've got to go. You've got to go. Brethren, it is hard for us to backtrack in our decisions. It's hard for us to say, I know I did it in good faith, but honestly, it really wasn't good faith because it wasn't faith because I didn't wait upon God. It's hard for us to backtrack. But undoing our bad decisions made in the flesh is difficult, but we will never get back on track until we cast out the bondwoman. What says scripture? Cast out the, the, the bondwoman. She's got to go. We have to believe that the omnipotent God, the omniscient God, the immutable God, it means he'll never change, the omnipresent God, we've got to believe that he knows better than us. Cast out the bondwoman. God has called us to be free. God has called us to have peace. But there will be no peace. There will be no prosperity. There will be no blessing until we cast out that bondwoman. Because until we cast out the bondwoman, there will be no room for the chosen son. The bondwoman wants us to keep our attention on earthly matters. She despises godliness. She despises paying attention to spiritual matters. She despises investing in holy things. But the Lord wants us to set our affections on things above, looking to the new Jerusalem, looking to his son. It is not possible for us to keep our eyes on heavenly things while the bondwoman lives in our home. If you get the allegory. Brethren, we've seen this morning that Abraham had two sons because he struggled to wait. And I, let me ask you a question. Do you find yourself like that man of God in that regard? You love the Lord, you really do. But you really struggle to wait because you're human. You struggle to wait on his time. Abraham saw a solution in himself. Have you, perhaps through impatience, looked for solutions? Because God has just taken too long. We can wait weeks, we can make, wait months, but years. It just rips the heart out of you, doesn't it? It tears at you. Perhaps looking, you're looking for a spouse or you're entertaining relationships that just aren't good for you. Regarding friends, you're allowing yourself to be influenced by the wrong people. Are you pursuing a career path that hinders you from seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Has a bond woman distracted you? So you find yourself, I just don't have any time for God anymore. I don't have time for reading my Bible. I don't have time for prayer. I don't have time for being involved in church. I don't have time to be at church. It's a blessing when I make the services at all. If that's what's going on in your life, the bond woman has you. She needs to go. Brethren, we won't find the solutions in here. 
there never are. Abraham had to look upward. Where are your eyes? Are they down here at your circumstances? Or are they on the Jerusalem which is above? Are they with the Lord? Brethren, Abraham had two sons, but one had to go. There is only room for one son. And folks, I think you know who that son is. His name is Jesus. If we try to hold anything else and make room for anything else, that's idolatry, isn't it? I think we all understand that. What does the Bible say? Cast out the man. Cast out anything that stands in the way of you having the best relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ ever. Get rid of it. I want to ask you this morning, do you want to look back on your life and say no regrets? I'm not saying you look back in your life and say no failures. We all have failures. We all have skeletons in our closet. We've all messed up. But you want to look back and say no regrets. I may have failed. I may have sinned. I may have done wrong. But God always bailed me out. And I looked at him. And, and, and the Lord and I, we just did this together. You know? We just did this together. No matter how hard it is for you, no matter how many changes you have to make, no matter how hard it is for you to make those changes, no matter how much backtracking you have to do, God wants you to live free, not in bondage. We sing about it, we talk about it. You shall love the truth and the truth shall make you free. We talk about that. Well, the only way we're going to be free is if the bond woman gets the booty. She has to go. And then we're free. Christianity is all about being free in Jesus Christ. This book of Galatians is all about liberty in Jesus Christ. And we love our liberties. But sometimes I find that the liberties Christians love, the, the liberties that Christians love, Christians love, are what they call liberties. Aren't liberty at all. Because it hasn't been bondage. Bondage to the world. Bondage to people's opinions, bondage to sin, and curse the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not being free. It's not. Being free is when you can enjoy the Lord. And you can enjoy his presence. And you have a clean conscience. And your focus is not honoring man or impressing man. It's on honoring Jesus Christ because you love him and he's the most important person in your life by far. If that's what you want, cast out the one woman. Let her go. And let Jesus set you free. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can we do that this morning?